What can Europe learn from history? We'll be discussing that with German historian Heinrich August Winkler. Welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the DW interview, coming to you today from Humboldt University in Berlin. I'm Thomas Spahn. Professor Winkler, I'd like to address your own personal history first, if I may. You and your mother were forced to flee East Prussia in 1944. You were five years old. What did the concept of Europe mean to you when you were a child? That was quite an upheaval, though I must add that our exodus occurred under somewhat privileged circumstances. My mother had understood very clearly that the war was coming to an end. She also understood what this horrible war would mean for East Prussia. She'd applied for a position as a substitute teacher at a boarding school in Württemberg. I remember the day we received permission to leave Königsberg. That was August 1944, although I did not fully understand what was going on. So on August 5th, 1944, we boarded a train heading from Königsberg to Ulm, and it was then that my memories really began. And so you came to the West. Let's picture Heinrich August Winkler at the age of five, and 71 years later, as a historian, you described your experiences to the German Bundestag. You spoke to the members of parliament 70 years after the end of the war. What were your feelings at that time? I had an immense feeling of gratitude that I had survived the war. Many of my generation had a horrible experience as they fled during the winter of 1944-45. But I was allowed to spend the end of the war at the foot of the Swabian Alps, first living under U.S. occupation until the Americans were replaced by the French. It was, I felt, a huge change, especially because there was no National Socialist indoctrination. I noticed that even as a child. I can remember that my grandmother, it must have been on the 2nd of May, told us that Hitler was dead. I asked, is that good? She said, yes. After a short pause, she said there would be difficult times ahead. That was typical of my experiences from that period. For example, one day some American soldiers removed two big iron crosses from the former convent chapel at a school, the Urspring School, and began to shoot the swastikas out of the middle. Those crosses were leaning up against the wall of the former convent chapel for months. They served as a reminder that this horrible chapter of German history had come to an end. Before we discuss what can Europe learn from history, let's ask a more fundamental question. Can one learn from history at all? Can one look at past developments to help determine a course of action for the future? Hegel is often quoted as saying, the only thing that one can learn from history is that one cannot learn from it. Frustrating for historians. Indeed, it would be extraordinarily frustrating. The Swiss historian Jakob Burkhardt said that studying history can't help a person be smart the next time, but it can make a person wise forever. That is, of course, quite an ambitious undertaking. Who on earth could achieve that? Very few, I fear. Perhaps one can learn not to repeat the same mistakes that were made in the past. There are enough new mistakes being made. Let's move on to more contemporary topics, like a third financial aid package for Greece. The first two packages failed. Would a third one be a mistake? Under the current circumstances, no, it would not be a mistake. But before we get to that point, let's ask whether the current situation shows us that the euro has a horrible design flaw. Was it a mistake to create a currency union without first creating a fiscal union and a political union? 
without harmonizing the budgetary, financial, and economic policies of the member states. So there was a design flaw in the treaties of the European Union. Those flaws could be fixed only if the politicians involved wanted that to happen and could make those changes. Should those politicians have shown the will and the courage to make those changes? It is richtig. That's correct. The enduring stability of a currency union can only be achieved if that union is accompanied by a fiscal union and supported by a core political union. So Germany and France primarily would have to reach an understanding, perhaps Germany, France and Italy. One can discuss whether a Grexit or a protracted Grexit might not have been better for Greece's self-respect instead of a fiscal aid package with conditions that limit Greek sovereignty. This solution was a compromise between factions that placed tough demands on Greece, demands that called for finally implementing long overdue structural reforms. And Germany was not the loudest of these proponents. It was Finland and the Baltic states, the Netherlands, Slovenia and Slovakia. But the perception in Europe is quite different. Many believe that an economically dominant Germany is setting the pace. Some may also believe that the other states reached out much more quickly to former Nazi Germany even after it had inflicted such horrors on all of Europe. They say that this same Germany now demands rigorous austerity measures and shows little empathy. So is it really arrogant of Germany to say we're not the only ones making those demands? No, it shows us that the European Union could easily have been torn apart by this situation. It was a contest between, to put it simply, the countries of the north and those of the Mediterranean. France and Italy have traditionally advocated a more flexible adherence to the Maastricht criteria. So if a compromise was to be found, it could only mean that Greece would stay in the Eurozone, but would finally have to implement long overdue structural reforms. These would include taxing the shipping industry and the Orthodox Church, introducing a more efficient civil service, implementing a functioning land registry system, and so on. There's a long list of demands. The problem is that Greece did not meet all the requirements when it applied to join the Eurozone, and it should not have been allowed to join. But they were allowed to join because their basic financial data was falsified. Okay, it's clear that Greece should have done more, but some also say that Greece should not be allowed to leave the Euro because that could mean the rolling back of European integration. Are these fears justified, or do the politicians simply lack courage? I'm not sure whether that feeling is widespread among the citizens of the member states, but it is certainly widely felt by many of our partners. That's why it's important to seek a compromise with France. If the Franco-German alliance is no longer able to agree on common solutions, then European integration is indeed seriously threatened. If a substantial number of the member states do not feel represented in the currency union or in the EU because the interests of the economically disciplined countries are under threat, that's a problem. It's not just Germany that's insisting that member states play by the rules. 
The question is whether a currency union can survive if its basic principles are constantly undermined or called into question. My answer is no. You can discuss creating new rules, but you cannot constantly undermine confidence in the common currency. This danger is still there. We're coming to the end of our interview, Professor Winkler, and I would like you to complete the following three sentences, if you would. The first is, my best advice for Chancellor Merkel in times like these is to consider the overall interest of the currency union, of the European Union, as a guide for making policy and insist that Germany must never be isolated during discussions of important decisions. Germany must be able to rely on its allies, and it would be wonderful if France were always brought on board as well. As a young historian, the biggest mistake I made about Europe was that it would take much less time to overcome the remnants of nationalism in all countries, including Germany. We've all had to learn that national traditions still carry a lot of weight. It's not a good idea to give the impression that Europe is being brought together despite the concept of nations. It can only be brought together with those nations. For me, learning from history means to try to avoid the mistakes of the past and to make as few new mistakes as possible. Heinrich August Winkler, thank you for talking with us today. Thank you.